If we bring to mind the overall meaning, rather than all the detail of the last lectures, including the one given yesterday, we can say that in the civilization which must energetically take over from our own in future, it will be demanded that people look more deeply into true reality, and that above all slogans or catchwords, or better, catch theories like monism, idealism, realism, and so on, come to an end. People will have to realize that the Maya reality, the reality of outer phenomena all around us, is a combination of two real worlds, and it is fair to say two worlds that fight one another. To look at reality as something very different from following the world of phenomena around us theoretically, the way it is done in natural science. Let us get down to practicalities and take a concrete example. I think you'll agree that everyone will think that the materialistic philosophy of life, which has spread among civilized nations mainly from the 1860s or 1870s, and the materialistic way of life which results from the ideas in that materialistic philosophy of life, also make human beings more materialistic under their influence. Looking at the phenomena in the world superficially, people think that the ideas human beings get into their heads lead to something which looks like an external realization of those ideas. But that is not how it is. As soon as one considers the successive configurations in real terms, it is not at all true that the world somehow arranges itself according to the ideas which people get in their heads. And one will only realize that this is not the case when one understands that human beings have the two sides to them of which we have spoken, and that the Aramonic and Luciferic principles are indeed interfering with one another all the time in the way I have described. It is only because of this that the following is possible. Let us assume that people were giving themselves up to materialistic ideas for a sufficiently long time during an era as has happened in our era. Led astray by those ideas, people would also develop some kind of materialistic way of life in their conscious will to act. The consequences would not arise in the part of the human nature which is the vehicle for conscious life. Initially, this vehicle for conscious life would not have the deep-reaching influence on human life which one would be inclined to think if taking a superficial view. No, the effect comes at the unconscious level. Schematically, you can visualize it as follows. Materialism lives in the conscious head nature of the human being and at the unconscious level, the part of our nature, which only goes through its metamorphosis when we have gone through the gate of death and live on for our next incarnation on earth, though we do already bear it within us, is something which is as yet incomplete. This lower nature, as we may call it, is the vehicle for the unconscious inner life. Strangely enough, it is growing more and more spiritual under the influence of materialism. Thus the real consequence of materialistic ideas, the real consequence also of a materialistic way of life, is that man's lower nature is growing more and more spiritual. You therefore have to imagine the following. If you go really deeply into ideas of energy and matter and believe only in them, and if you arrange your life in such a way that you say, quote, food and drink, and then, after death, nothingness, close quote, and do everything you do in this style, materialism will truly become your way of life, and the lower nature will then grow more and more spiritual. But then this lower nature, which is growing more and more spiritual, demands that something else influence it for it cannot make the progress which it must make through world evolution on its own. The consequence of having only materialistic ideas and materialistic sympathies 
in the upper nature of the human being is that this upper nature cannot influence the lower nature of the individual and that the lower nature is therefore exposed to other influences. Upper nature being powerless, lower nature is exposed to the influence of the Luciferic principle. The Luciferic principle does not come into its own in the reality perceived through the senses, as I told you yesterday. The Luciferic entities are spirits. They enter into the lower nature of human beings when this grows more and more spiritual under the influence of materialism. And it is exactly because of materialism that nothing from the human beings themselves can enter into their lower nature. The paradoxical truth is that a materialist era is in reality always the preparation for a spiritual, though luciferic, culture. Let us also look at the opposite situation. Let us assume an ecclesiastical truth, not filled with spiritualism, but resting purely on tradition, takes hold of people, or was intended to take hold of them. Abstract idealism is related to such an ecclesiastical truth. Belief is limited to abstract ideals, especially in the moral sphere. And there is no feeling for the way in which the abstract ideals arise. For however excellent such ideals may be, they will serve no purpose unless one has a feeling for the way in which they may turn into powers. Purely religious and purely idealistic ideas mean that the lower nature of human beings grows more and more materialistic, whilst materialistic ideas encourage spiritualism in man's lower nature. Purely ecclesiastical views based on tradition with no spiritual aspect or abstract human idealism encourage lower human nature to grow more and more material. I'd say that the typical figure showing this material progression due to traditional abstract ecclesiastical views please forgive the drastic choice of words is the fat prelate given up to traditional ecclesiastical views, his paunch growing larger and larger in the process. It is merely a comparison, it is not a fact, and not a law of which I speak. I merely want to illustrate. But it is in line with a reality which is behind these things. This process of lower human nature growing more and more material does, however, lack sustenance if there are only traditional or abstract idealistic notions in the head. A humanity which establishes such a civilization is predominantly exposed not to its own head nature, but to the Aramonic influences. We therefore have to say that abstract religious elements, abstract idealism, essentially encourage materialism, a materialism with Aramonic orientation whilst materialistic ideas encourage a spiritualism with luciferic orientation. Essentially all these things arise because genuine reality is something completely different from the apparent outward reality. Now, however, it behooves us to get to know the genuine reality, its laws and nature. Social science, the science of human beings living together, and of the historical life of humanity, will have to be imbued more and more with a spiritual science, which truly builds a bridge in the way I have indicated in these lectures between the natural order and the order of the spirit. Building the real bridge and not the abstract one of monism. For this it will, however, be necessary that certain laws of the true reality laws of which people are also not made aware by initiates who are not thinking in the right way for the present time, do get more and more widely known. One such law you may think of as follows. You know if you follow the true meaning of my title Occult Science and Outline, when humanity, as we call it at present, did actually first appear on earth, this humanity also has a cosmic history 
in the sense reiterated yesterday, Saturn, Sun, Moon, history. But to begin with its earthly history was recapitulation, and earthly humanity first appeared at a quite specific time. Reading it up in my occult science, you'll find that this humanity appeared at the very time when the mineral world arose clearly and distinctly on earth. We know that the mineral world, as we now call it, did not exist in the same way during Saturn, Sun, and Moon time. The three realms which preceded the mineral world were there. The mineral world came into earth evolution, and at the same time as this macrocosmic fact of the mineral world appearing in earth evolution, man appeared in his present form, in the form which his body has at the present time, in his present bodily configuration. This bodily configuration only developed fully in the course of time, but the potential for it appeared at the same time as the mineral world in earth evolution. In a sense, therefore, human beings established a connection as earthly human being, or in becoming earthly human being, between the fourth level of existence, which then developed into the capital I, and the mineral world. We might also say that in the human microcosm, the I corresponds to the macrocosmic mineral world. We know from simple superficial observation of the natural world that the cosmic mineral world is crystalline in configuration. Our children have to learn the different crystalline forms at school, getting to, getting to know them first according to the laws of geometry, as these can be shown and then in the way in which they actually occur in the mineral world, octahedron, cube, and so on. Looking at these geometrical configurations of the mineral world, we essentially have the configuration which is utterly the mineral world's own. This crystallization, or better, these crystalline forms, are in a sense inherent in the mineral world, utterly its own and in integrating the mineral world into its cosmic evolution, the earth did at the same time take in the tendency to crystallize its mineral matter in the forms that belong to the mineral world. There is a counterpole, a polar opposite, to this form principle in the mineral world. I would ask you to consider the following. Let us approach an important fact of life in an image. You are no doubt all familiar with the common phenomenon of some substances dissolving. You know that if you put a certain amount of salt into a certain volume of water, the water is capable of completely dissolving the salt. This is then no longer in its solid form, but has dissolved in the water. You also know that solid salt would be of no use for certain purposes in practical life, and it is necessary to dissolve the salt in liquid. Now the tendency of minerals to crystallize in earth evolution must not stay connected with this earth just as salt must not stay in its solid form for certain practical purposes. The cook must be able to change the solid form of salt into its dissolved form. She must use solvents, otherwise the salt would serve no purpose. In the same way, the tendency of minerals to crystallize must be dissolved in the cosmos. So there has to be a counter-tendency, a polar opposite, which will ensure that this crystalline tendency has dissolved, is no longer there when the earth has reached the goal of its evolution and will be about to change into its next form, the Jupiter form. Jupiter must no longer have the tendency to crystallize minerals. This tendency must be reserved for the earth's body and must cease when the earth will have come to the end of earth evolution. The polar opposite to the tendency to crystallize is the tendency which is imprinted in the human and not the animal form. Every dead body which we give to planet earth in some form or other, burying or cremating it or whatever, every dead body in which the human form is still active as purely mineral form, every dead body from which soul and spirit have departed, counteracts the mineral 
crystallization tendency, just as negative electricity counteracts positive electricity, or darkness counteracts light. At the end of Earth evolution, all human forms imparted to the Earth during this evolution, the forms, I say, and not the substance, for it is the power that lies in the form with which we are concerned, will have cosmically dissolved the tendency to mineralize, to crystallize in the process of mineralization. You see how, again, a point is added where the bridge is built between two streams in the world, a bridge which cannot be built with natural science. In natural science, one investigates the changes to the human form after death in purely mineralogical terms, applying only the laws of mineralogy. One looks only for the things that are connected with the earth's tendency to crystallize, treating the dead body in the same way. It means one will never discover the significant role which the dead human bodies, their form, plays in the earth's economy. The earth has changed enormously from the middle of the Lemurian age since mineralization has begun, and hence the tendency to crystallize. Anything on earth that is less mineral, tending less toward crystallization than in the middle of the Lemurian age, is so thanks to the dissolving forms of human bodies. The tendency to crystallize will have gone completely when the earth has reached its final goal. All the human forms given to the earth will have acted as the polar opposite and dissolved the crystallization. There the event of human death is also seen as a purely physical phenomenon in the whole of world economy. There the bridge is built between phenomena, such as the phenomenon of death, which otherwise make no sense in world economy, and the phenomena which are referred to in natural science today. It is important that we develop such views more and more, views that give the natural scientific view its true and proper character. What I have been telling you is a natural scientific fact, like any other natural scientific facts discovered today. It is, however, a fact which cannot be discovered with just natural scientific methods. The present-day methods of natural science must of necessity remain inadequate and therefore cannot encompass all phenomena of life. Natural science must therefore be complemented with spiritual science. When laws as comprehensive as this one will be known, laws saying that human forms given to the planet Earth will dissolve the Earth's tendency to crystallize, the laws will also make the human mind ready to enter more deeply into the reality of spiritual evolution. Someone who thinks and investigates only in terms of present-day natural science cannot bridge the gulf between natural science and social and political science. Only those who know the great laws established on the basis of spiritual science that relate to the great things in nature, as I have just been showing, will find it possible to cross the bridge that goes from natural science to the humanities above all to the historical and political life of humanity. Natural scientists will not hesitate to say that polarity exists in nature. They will distinguish between two forms of magnetism, one of the north, the other of the south. They will distinguish between two forms of electricity, positive and negative. When it will be possible one day to take natural science more along the proper lines of Gertianism, Natural science will also be more Gertian than it can be today when it is so hardly at all. The law of polarity will be known then as the basic law in the whole of nature, the way it did already figure in the ancient mysteries, then on the basis of atavistic methods of investigation. In the ancient mysteries everything was based on insight into polarity in the world. In natural science itself, that is, in investigating the natural order. Modern scientists are perfectly happy to acknowledge the existence of polarity 
but they won't touch this polarity when it comes to the human order and the cultural order. Yet in the spirit and its orders, which also include man, the principles we call Luciferic and Aramane fully correspond to the north and south magnetism or the positive and negative electricity, which are accepted in natural science. People will never know how to establish real harmony between spirit and nature until the true things, a concrete polarity of the Aramanic and the Luciferic, are found in the order of the spirit. True reality cannot be found in abstract concepts, which are simply transferred from nature to spirit, but only by entering deeply into the spirit itself and to find the correspondence corresponding polarities in the sphere of the spirit. It has to be the same with the other facts of nature. You cannot simply study facts of nature and then say you are basing a spiritual order or philosophy of life on these natural scientific facts. This will not get you anywhere. To study spiritual life in its reality, even just the phenomena of life, where the spirit has an influence. You have to resolve to study the spiritual orders themselves. Things that happen at some period of time, arising from human souls and human activities, cannot be explained using natural scientific methods. In reality, you can only understand them if you use the methods of natural science to elucidate them. If you want to consider certain phenomena of our present civilization, for instance, you must clearly establish to what extent the Luciferic element plays a role in our present civilization and to what extent the Aramanic principle does. I made the attempt in 1914 before the present catastrophe came upon us in the lectures entitled The Inner Nature of Man and Our Life Between Death and New Birth, a course I gave in Vienna before this war began, let me quote the important passage where I spoke of the key issue of today. Quote, this spiritual science has now made its appearance in the world because human evolution makes it necessary that penetration of the spiritual worlds and their conditions lives more and more in human souls, instinctively at first and then deliberately so. Let me tell you something which is completely perceptible to the senses so that you may see how people will, more and more, reach a point where they can judge the true content of life on the physical plane only if they also know the laws of spiritual existence. It is entirely in the world of Maya, but of tremendous importance. Looking at the world of nature, we see the strange spectacle that everywhere only a small number of seeds are used to continue the life of a species, and a vast number of seeds perish. We look at the vast numbers of fish embryos in the ocean. Some grow into fish, others perish. We look out over a field and see countless wheat grains. Only a few of them will be wheat plants. The others perish in serving human beings as food and being used in other ways. Much, much more has to be produced in the natural world than the amount which truly becomes fruit in the steady stream of existence and then germinates again. It is good that it is like this in nature, for out there we have the order and necessity where anything which comes away from the stream it belongs to, the stream of existence and of fruiting which is based in itself, serves the other continuous stream of existence. Human beings and animals would not be able to live if all seeds truly bore fruit and achieved the development which is inherent in them. There have to be seeds which are used to establish the basis, as it were, from which life forms can grow. If we take the Maya point of view, it merely seems that something is lost. But the truth is that nothing is lost. The spirit is at work in this nature, and it is due to the wisdom in the spirit that nothing is really lost within the creative world of nature. It is spiritual law, and we must look at the matter from the spiritual point of view. We will then discover that anything which seems to be taken out of the stream of existence in the world does also have the right to exist. 
This is rooted in the spirit. It will therefore also have the right to exist on the physical plane insofar as we live a life in the spirit. Readers aside, I have not found the closing quote. I believe that this is still a continued quote from Steiner's lecture. End of readers aside. My dear friends, take a very obvious situation. Public lectures must be given on the subject of our spiritual science. The audiences come together simply because of the announcements. The situation is rather similar to that of the grains of wheat, only some of which are used in the continuous stream of existence. One must not shy away from facing the fact that one has to speak of the streams of spiritual life before many, many people who have apparently come at random and that only a few of them will enter into this spiritual life, become anthroposophists, and go along with the continuous stream. In this field, the situation still is that these scattered seeds reach many people, who may then go away after a public lecture and say, subquote, what a lot of rubbish that man was talking, close subquote. Looking at the way we do in everyday life, it is rather like all those fish embryos in the ocean being lost but not if one takes a deeper look. The souls who came because of their karma and then went away saying, subquote, what a lot of rubbish that man was talking, close subquote, are not yet right to take in the truth of the Spirit. Their souls do, however, need to feel that the power that lies in the science of the Spirit is coming up to them in this incarnation. And that feeling will go on, living in their souls, however much they may complain about it. It lives on in their souls for the next incarnation, and so the seeds are not lost. They find ways. Existence in the spirit is subject to the same laws. Irrespective of whether we study the spirit in the natural order or in the case which we have been able to cite as our own. But let us now assume that we intend to apply this also in everyday life, saying, subquote, well, this is also the way in which it is done in everyday life, close subquote, It is indeed the case, my friends, that in doing what I will describe to you now, we move toward a future where this will emerge more and more. People keep producing, building factories, and never ask how much is required. You know there was once a tailor in a village who would only make a suit when it had been ordered. It was the consumer who determined how much was to be produced. Now people produce for the market. Goods are piled up as much as possible. Production exactly follows the principle which applies in the natural world. The natural world is also applied in the sphere of the social order. To begin with, this will be more and more the case. But we are here entering into the sphere of material things. Being valid only for the spiritual world, the spiritual law does not apply in everyday life and so something very peculiar arises. We are here amongst ourselves, and so it is possible to say such things. The world, however, will not meet us with understanding. People are producing for the market today, taking no account of consumption, not in the sense of my essay titled Anthroposophy and the Social Question, but using storage facilities and the money markets to produce stacks of things and then waiting to see how much is bought. This trend will grow and grow until it will destroy itself. You'll see why from what I am going to say next. Close quote. This is the most important of the causes of the present war. It must, however, be derived from spiritual life. Continue quote. With this kind of production in social life, exactly the same develops in the social relationships of people on earth as in the organism when cancer develops It's exactly the same, a cancer, a cancer of civilization. Someone able to see through life from the spiritual point of view will see the dreadful beginnings of social cancers popping up everywhere. This is the dreadful thing, so depressing. Even if one could otherwise suppress all enthusiasm for spiritual science, if one could suppress the urge to open one's mouth and speak for spiritual science, to shout out to the world the remedy for something which is definitely coming and will be getting worse and worse. If something which should be the dissemination of spiritual truths in its proper field happens in a sphere where things happen as in nature, 
entering into the civilization in the way I've described, this will cause cancer to develop. Close quote. Let me read that last sentence again. If something which should be the dissemination of spiritual truths in its proper field happens in a sphere where things happen as in nature, entering into civilization in the way I have described, this will cause cancer to develop. Close quote. You find an ex- exposition of everything that is taken from the Aramonic and the Luciferic worlds preceding this passage in the lecture. You will see there that one will not come to perceive the reality in the development of social cancers by simply comparing social life with the facts of nature. One has to look at the Aramonic and the Luciferic aspects to discover the real tendencies active in the present-day social order. Things that proceed in the social order must be looked for using spiritual methods. Using the methods of materialism will not produce anything but at most a comparison and analogy to social processes with abstract facts in the natural world. In those lectures given in Vienna from 9 to 14, April 1914, I said that many cancerous tumors existed in the present-day social order, but merely said it to sum up something I have essentially spoken of in different ways in the years in which our anthroposophical movement has been developing. This was to prepare people for the time when the social cancer would be in a particular crisis, in 1914. A book has just been published, a rather foolish, worthless book, dated 1918 and published by Max Rascher in Zurich. It is C. H. Murray's titled Weltmutation, World Mutation. I'll read you some passages from the book. The author has completely focused his mind on economic facts. And whereas the things said in those lectures on the inner nature of man were helpful in arriving at reality, this book encourages people to turn away from true reality leads them into wrong ways of thinking. I'll quote you some passages from the book. The author endeavors to grasp the development of European and American civilization merely by comparison, analogy, with facts of nature. My lectures, given in 1914, give you the reality. But here you get abstract monistic comparisons, mere analogies, that do not really say anything. Essentially, if one speaks just of facts of nature and then suggests that such things also exist in the social order, not understanding the social order but merely pointing out analogies, this obscures rather than illumines understanding. But what does it lead to? It is shown how from antiquity seeds of disintegration gradually entered into Western civilization, gnawing away at it from within. Such an aperçu is then put in words like this. Quote, These pathological changes started in the early Renaissance cities as they came into flower, in the city republics of still purely productive middle classes, when they had to feed their giant cell, cancer, adapted to the need and so had to become an apparatus for feeding a cancerous nodule. The development of this institution, this organization, which then became the structure of a modern state, went hand in hand with the transformation of the productive tissue, a tissue which must definitely not be considered to be part of their own life. Close quote. He refers to civilization, the order of civilization, as a productive tissue. That is, he merely raises a tissue of natural facts and not the genuine spiritual fact. Quote, For foreign elements cannot normally be in contact with one another in bodies without causing inflammation, as initially such inflammations also occurred when the Burgrave's soldiers came in contact with the Burgers. Think of the bells being rung to call the Burgers together. Normally this would simply have meant cutting out the toxic nodule. People did start to do this, and efforts to do so may also be seen in later times. Yet the moment the two elements, the cancerous nodule and the tissue at work or trade, 
were able to tolerate one another without getting inflamed, an anomaly arose which could only maintain itself under pathological conditions. Such abnormalities are found everywhere, in organisms where tumors, ulcers, in short, foreign elements are encapsulated to avoid inflammation. The tissue which develops is a deformity, and once healed, serves no further purpose in the organism. During the disease it does, however, serve to protect the organism. It is an arrangement which, make, which makes the poison harmless in the body, though it may, on occasion, hypertrophy, grow beyond all bounds and then be a seriously morbid element in s- itself. The modern state has thus also arisen as a deformity in a life of work or trade that was continually burrowed through. All the tissue needed to work together, however, to protect itself as the deformity developed, and to paralyze the harmful nature of it and counteract the destructive toxic effects. The state accordingly developed as a separate structure, which, whilst interlacing productive life, never did itself become the structure, the apparatus, of productivity. The system of the whole of modern economics developed separately, alongside the state. The richest people, who required extensive protection for their commercial dealings, had the most immediate relationship with the toxic nodule. Because of this, they were also more eager and, being rich, also more able to offer more to the Burgrave. They provided the money he needed, and he would turn to the patricians when he wanted to get somewhere with the city. It was very much in their interest that the prince be strong. Others, whose trading did not go beyond the city walls, had a regular natural dislike of the Burgrave, physiologically a negative chemotactic effect. They would really only tolerate him because of the protection given by the surrounding walls. The toxic effect did not, or only rarely, change the patrician's individual nature. They would only rarely become warring nobles, for they did already belong too much to the anti-toxic tissue of work or trade. Their wealth had come from this and was bound up with it. There would be a toxic effect not on the individual but on the protoplasm, meaning their wealth. In the past, wealth certainly did not func- serve or function as capital, but merely as the reserves for life and prosperity. Now its role was changing. Wealth began to have work processes connected with it. Close quote. At this point, I'd ask you to recall that in 1908, I pointed out in lectures I gave in Nuremberg, which have now also appeared in print, that the modern economic order is removed from direct personal influence and how money, capital as such, begins to work. I said, quote, the, the present day social order is under the Aramanic influence working its way up in such a way that now one individual is on top and then another. The individual does not count any longer. What matters is that money as such runs things, casting an individual up and then throwing him down again. The shares, the piling up of capital, and the credit system as its counterpole, this impersonal and anti-personal way, is the Aramonic counter-image to the spirit self, and intended to develop for the future social order. Close quote. In the book all this is put in purely Aramonic terms. There is, however, a danger that it will be considered with the greatest respect, because page by page it presents extensive notes relating to natural science. This aramonic caricature of spiritual science has appeared years after reference was made to reality found through spiritual scientific investigation. It is often using the same words for the same phenomenon. It will impress people in spite of being misleading, unless they want to build a bridge from the external natural scientific facts that are presented here and the purely spiritual scientific processes which can only be found with the help of spiritual science. It will undoubtedly happen 
that something like this, like other things that have occurred and of which I have spoken in my lectures, will be accepted as genuine scientific knowledge, whilst the scientific validity of spiritual science will, without doubt, be denied and fought against most dreadfully in the immediate future, and this with an intensity which you cannot even imagine as yet. One must be able to see through these things, all the more so as these facts are just below the irreality of outward reality. It does need good will to gain insight into such facts, the will to follow the spiritual scientific investigations sensibly and with sound common sense. Opposing streams, polarities, must be balanced out. This can only happen if new influences come all the time into events on earth. Influences coming directly from the spiritual world, so that new facts concerning the world are continually revealed out of the spirit. People once brought a Jesuit to me in Rome and I had a talk with him on this subject, although I knew that it was pointless and that it really was a case of love's labor lost. The reasons behind it are, of course, different, for there, too, one must consider the genuine reality and not the outward appearance of things. I tried to explain to the Jesuit that in the first place he himself has to assume a revelation of the supersensible in the mystery on Golgotha and what has been written about it in the inspired Gospels, and that the Roman Catholic Church does assume a continual development of spiritual life in the case of the saints. He replied, as one would expect, quote, Yes, all that is correct, but it is over. One must not bring it about intentionally. In the present time, it is a devilish thing to work one's way through to spiritual life. It is permissible to study the mystery on Golgotha, the Gospels, and the lives of the saints, but unless one wants to be in the power of demons, it is not permissible in any way to seek to make a direct connection with the spiritual world. Close quote. It was to be expected that he would say this. I could give you many such examples. There are those who are utterly against more and more new spiritual truths getting known. The Roman Catholic Church greatly fears even spiritism, which we are certainly not in sympathy with. They are afraid that it might happen that something from the spiritual world comes across through a medium, something which the Church cannot admit as it wants to stay within its old traditions. It fears spiritism because it is based on materialism and could easily so the church people have believed for decades, gain adherence when in some way or other something might be instilled into the world from the spiritual world and the church wants to rule the world. You know that in 1879 the possibility arose for the spiritual world to have a tremendous deep-reaching effect. I have said on several occasions that the battle that had been fought among spirits in the spiritual world entered into the earthly order, the Michaelic order. Since then there have been occasions when things of the Spirit were taken in by human beings who wished to do so. Please do not think that the initiates in the Roman Catholic Church do not know this. They know these things, of course, but build dams to keep them away. It is exactly in connection with this fact that spiritual life has been especially nurtured by the spiritual world since 1879, that the Roman Catholic Church has, with foresight, established the dogma of papal infallibility as a dam to hold back the possible influence of any spiritual truths. Now, of course, if people are... Tha- now, of course, if people are, thanks to the infallibility dogma, only permitted to work inwardly through things proclaimed ex cathedra from the papal chair, as they seek to develop a philosophy of life, that is a mighty dam to block the inflow of spiritual truths directly from the spiritual world. This is the one, the Roman element, which had its conditions pertaining to nature in the past, 
and from these brought across the rigidity in its traditions, the rigidity in excluding any spiritual substance that might enter into human souls. Another stream must be looked for at the center, which at about the time when the infallibility dogma coming from Rome was in preparation, has to be taken serious note of for the peoples of the English-speaking world in England and America. We have spoken of this occult center on various occasions. Traditional and falsely idealistic elements in the head allow Araman to make himself felt in the lower human being. As you have seen, materialism causes spiritual principles to develop in the lower human being. And of course, if it is not kept supplied from the head with the new spiritual truths which are revealed to the world from time to time, it will be caught by Luciferic powers, Luciferic principles. The center which has such a great influence on the Anglo-American peoples mainly seeks to reckon with the other pole. The occult masonry, rooted in this center, has a great influence on developments in the outward culture of the whole civilized world. It encourages materialism. Being able to see through things, just as Rome has done with the papal infallibility dogma. Rome used infallibility to build a dam to prevent spiritual truths coming in from the spiritual worlds. Masonry seeks deliberately to encourage the spread of materialism in modern civilization, the spread of materialistic ideas in a lifestyle that is more or less materialistic. And the peculiar thing is that Anglo-American initiates are generally right when they speak of Rome. However much they vituperate about Rome, they are saying the right thing. They also know that there is spiritual life and the possibility of a continuous influence though they keep this secret, only allowing it to flow into civilization through unknown channels. The non-English-speaking peoples in the civilized world have in recent decades, we can say in the last half century, most extensively taken in the things that came from that center. In the form which they take at present, other cultures are not really existing on their own but are in many ways fed by the materialistic tendency coming from that center. What Rome says of the center of that occult Freemasonry, the orders, is also right. We may say, therefore, that what Rome says is right and what the occult Freemasons say is also right. This is indeed the problem, that in reality these things are most eminently able to throw people to the Luciferic or the Aramonic side, but are not open to censure in what they say, because what they are saying is quite right. They say the right thing when speaking about the others. This fact merits thorough attention in the trends of modern civilization. People generally fail to look and see what becomes of something or other. They always look at things which are put into words for propaganda. But it is not the wording of any propaganda which matters. Materialism in the world of ideas was meant to make the lower human being too materialistic. But it actually makes it spiritual. It should be that by talking abstract idealism, talking of all kinds of beautiful moral ideals, we make human beings more moral. In fact, we make them, forgive me, speaking metaphorically, fat, materialistic in their lower nature, dull and sleepy. On the one hand, there is a marked tendency to make human beings harmonic and sclerotic, above all a Jesuitical way of doing things. On the other hand, there is a marked tendency to make the Luciferic spirits serve the materialistic world order so that materialism leads to spirituality, spiritualization, but with luciferic orientation. It really is not enough merely to consider only the surface appearance of things and take it literally. We have to consider true reality. 
as our examples have shown today, paradoxical though they may seem, often the opposite purpose is served from what a superficial view suggests. The present situation is that people are working in the world according to the principle of occult orders, but keeping the matter secret. Rome is working according to the occult order, and so is the other center. Power lies in the fact that people are kept in the dark and not told what is really going on. This is the source of the hatred and enmity toward people who then come and tell them what is going on. The naivete of some people, a naivete where they keep thinking that something is achieved with the streams I have mentioned, is particularly harmful when one shows them that our spiritual science leads to a beautiful view of Christ Jesus or the like, when one shows them how the most profound truths of spiritual science may be found in genuine Christianity. It is naive to think one can gain the attention of certain groups if one shows them that one has a truth which they really ought to acknowledge, considering the whole of their principles. This will actually provoke opposition. The more we show certain groups that we have the truth, the greater will be their opposition. And the more this truth proves effective, the more intense will the opposition be. In recent times, people were merely wanting to see if the anthroposophical books were available in greater numbers, and thousands of people listened to anthroposophy, after all, before going into the attack, not because they think that anthroposophy is untrue, but because they fear that anthroposophy will offer the truth. This has to be considered. There should be no naivete in our ranks but penetrating perception, looking at things without prejudice or bias. It would please me if you were to take a sentiment and impression home with you from this lecture. Let me repeat once more what I said at the beginning of today's lecture. It is not so much the details which matter, but a general impression, a sentience of the whole spirit of this lecture. Gaining this, we can make ourselves more and more capable of taking our place in our present civilization. And in present-day life, as it behooves someone who is truly awake and not asleep in the present time, we will continue with this the next time. <laughs>